Well, again, thanks, Rich, for the introduction. Um, in terms of my affiliations, uh, I'm Associate Professor in Environmental History at the University of Bristol, and I'm very much speaking today in my academic capacity. Uh, so this is nothing at all to do with my work at the FCDO. And in fact, the research project, uh, which this talk is based on, I completed long before I started uh, that uh, temporary secondment role. So speaking purely in a personal academic capacity today. So this project and the talk in particular that I'm giving today focuses on the politics that follow on from major natural hazard driven disasters in colonial South Asia. And I started this project because there was a series of really big earthquakes in uh, the countries that are now India, Pakistan, Myanmar and Nepal. Uh, and Bangladesh uh, between about the 1890s and the 1930s, which was a really interesting period for changing relations between the colonial state and uh, the various peoples who lived there, particularly through the growth of anti-colonial nationalist movements. <clears throat> uh, and I began this project with the question, all these big earthquakes must have changed something politically, so what did they change, how much and why? But I found quickly that actually there was very little of what you might call overt political change after these earthquakes. And the question quickly shifted to why, why wasn't there political change? What was it that the colonial states, state and other actors were doing during this period, which tended towards stabilization of what was frankly a time of massive political upheaval? Why were these earthquakes apparent oases of a, of a lack of political dissent? Uh, and the answer that I'm going to put forward today really lies in the dynamic between the colonial government and the Indian nationalist movement as particularly represented and driven by the Indian National Congress, which was uh, India's premier nationalist body. But before getting into the specifics of the talk, let me just outline briefly <coughs> what the project was and, and make some acknowledgements. So the project Broken Ground, uh, formally speaking, ran from 2017 to 2020. As you can tell, I'm still working on generating the outputs, uh, writing up and continuing to give talks based on this research. It was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council through the GCRF, uh, and I partnered with the NGO NSET, the National Society for Earthquake Technology in Kathmandu, which I dare say some of you know and perhaps have worked with yourselves. Um, <clears throat> I headed a small research team uh, principally Deb Jyoti Das, who was a postdoc who was with me for the first year, and two freelance researchers who did some archival digging for me in Delhi and Quetta. Uh, but broadly speaking, most of this is uh, traditional historical research in the sense that I, the historian, have done most of the research. Um, so although I've been involved in various big interdisciplinary uh, multi-investigated projects, particularly on hazards in the Himalaya, this was a much more traditional kind of history project. The five earthquakes that I'm looking at <coughs> um, took place effectively across the arc of the Himalaya Hindu Kush um, with, with one down in Lower Burma, what is now southern Myanmar near Rangoon, uh, between the 1890s <coughs> and the 1930s. Uh, so these weren't the only major earthquakes that happened in colonial South Asia, uh, but they really do form a cluster of quite significant ones um, in a relatively short period of time. And some of these earthquakes uh, were really quite substantial in terms of uh, mortality rates. So the Kangra and Quetta earthquakes, the two at the top left of the map, um, killed 20,000 and 30,000 people respectively. The Nepal Bihar earthquake about 14 or 15,000, uh, and then the Shillong and Lower Burma earthquakes um, under 2,000 each. Uh, I should note that mortality figures are pretty sketchy, so these are approximates only. Um, but earthquakes as a whole have been responsible for an estimated one third of all the deaths from natural hazards uh, in India between 1977 and 2002. So cumulatively, although individual earthquakes uh, might not be as lethal to as large a number of people as a major famine or something like the polar cyclone in uh, what is now Bangladesh in 1970, which killed anywhere between 200 and 300,000 people as far as I know. Um, cumulatively, earthquakes are a, a great threat to life in the region, uh, and partly that's why I wanted to pay them some attention. 
There's also historical interest in this period because, as I mentioned, this really this time frame really brackets the emergence, growth, and dominance of the Indian nationalist movement, um, famously represented by Mohandas Karamchand or Mahatma Gandhi, pictured here on his salt march in 1930. Um, but also the growth of the so-called Takin movement in Burma, the Burmese nationalist movement, which really gathered momentum in the later 1930s, so a little after this earthquake. Uh, but still, the point is that anti-colonial sentiments were growing in the colony. Um, and I'm not focusing on Nepal today, but the Rana regime in Nepal also faced concerted opposition from the late 1930s and especially in the 1940s. So really this is a time of huge political upheaval and huge change across uh, South Asia, across the subcontinent. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this is a fairly traditional historical project in some ways, and I've used some of the traditional archives, notably the British Library collections here in London, um, plus state archives in India, Pakistan, Myanmar, also Nepal, but as I said, I'm not discussing Nepal, so I've left that off here. Um, I've also used a large number of published sources, particularly publications which both the colonial government and the Congress um, produced, which I'm especially going to examine today in terms of narratives of post-earthquake situations, private memoirs and uh, newspapers. There are also some other archives like the Church Missionary Society archive uh, and Kew Gardens archives, which have informed other uh, sort of spin-off mini projects that have come out of this which are more focused on cultural understanding and experiences of earthquakes rather than the politics uh, i'd be more than happy to talk about those in the q a if anyone's interested but i'm not going to focus on them in this talk so it's worth noting that i don't have all the information i would like to have about these earthquakes and the nature of archival research is you're dependent on what somebody decided was worth recording a hundred years ago so, for example, I can't say with any degree of certainty how many buildings were damaged in these colonial earthquakes because the colonial Indian government didn't do building censuses. And in fact, after the Bihar earthquake, the official report on the hazard event um, says explicitly, we did not try and count the buildings because we have no idea. Um, as I've already indicated, uh, mortality rates were calculated in various ways and not always necessarily 100% uh, robust and uh, do not take account of indirect mortality. So I'm not going to get into this either. I keep trailing things I'm not talking about. One of those things is uh, the enormous impact that the Bihar earthquake particularly had on uh, public health, human health and increases in disease incidents in the years afterwards. So my, my mortality figures are just people who are directly killed during the shaking or immediately afterwards. What I am going to talk about today <clears throat> follows, three, follows four parts. And uh, I'm going to take a broadly narrative approach to this, not 100% chronological, uh, but I'm largely going to tell you the story of what the colonial government and what nationalists did in the wake of these earthquakes and why, and how I think, how and why their interactions tended to produce um, a surprising amount of consensus and stability in what was otherwise an extremely fractious political context. So I'll begin by demonstrating that something changed in the colonial state's earthquake response. In other words, that we go from a fairly laissez-faire state, which doesn't want to intervene after hazards in the 19th century, through to a highly interventionist state by the 1930s, which in many ways prefigures the kind of uh, major disaster response we expect to see from governments today. Uh, secondly, I'll look at explaining that change. Thirdly, digging into <clears throat> one particular factor, which I think is especially important, and that is the colonialist, colonial nationalist dynamic. And I'll admit, hit this part of the story is where I'll spend the most time. Uh, but then finally, I'll look at one instance, <coughs> the last earthquake of these in Quetta in 1935, um, and think about the way that that dynamic broke down. So how that happened, why that happened, and what were the consequences. So my conclusion, just to foreshadow that a little, will be where the where government and nationalists both thought they had something to gain from cooperation, they did so. Um, but where one side perceived it could get an advantage, in the case of Quetta, uh, there was political fallout. As I said, this will be a pretty much narrative-focused um, presentation, 
I'm not going to get into the uh, small but growing historiography around colonial earthquakes and colonial earth Indian earthquakes in particular, but I will just note that Ellen Markerson has a book coming out, I believe, late next month on the Bihar earthquake, um, and she's done fantastically detailed archival research all across Bihar. Uh, and so a lot of what I say is uh, sort of it may be contradicted by uh, Eleanor's work when it comes out. So I'm really looking forward to reading the book um, and I may revise some of my uh, opinions about what happened and why in light of it. Um, and I should also note that there are uh, major debates in disaster risk reduction studies <coughs> uh, framed around the idea of critical junctures, which many of you may be familiar with, um, which this material could also speak to. Uh, but again, I'm not going to get into that uh, area of theory today. So let's crack on with part one then. What changed in the colonial states earthquake response and why? Here we have a fairly schematic rendering of the change over time in terms of government action after earthquakes. And you can see in the left hand column, well on the very left, left I've just reminded you um, where the earthquakes happened, indicated their magnitude and an approximation of how many people were killed as a proxy for how much damage they did to, to human societies. Uh, but on the left of the diagram, <coughs> I have short term government relief, which I'm pretty much defining as in the, the hours, days, perhaps weeks after each earthquake and longer term relief, which we might also term uh, recovery, rehabilitation, reconstruction in a DRR terminology. So you can see the trend in, in both cases is for increasing intervention. And we go from pretty minimal intervention in the short term uh, from the first earthquake through to heavy intervention uh, at the um, Quetta and Bihar earthquakes. And just to, to fill in a little bit of detail on <coughs> what I'm talking about here, uh, I'll take each earthquake very briefly in turn. The Assam earthquake in 1897 uh, prompted a meaningful government response. Um, the government didn't just throw its hands up in the air, but it was all handled by the provincial government led by a commissioner in chief of Assam. Uh, a lot of the work was done by the military detachments who are staring at. I'm hearing some pings, which I hope is not somebody trying to tell me something in the chat. Um, if it's for my attention, please do use a voice. Uh, so <laughs> in Assam, there was, there was a bit of intervention particularly um, imposing law and order, so trying to make sure that uh, treasuries were not open to looting um, by potential miscreants, um, as well as some relief and rescue work, which was done by the army, the police, uh, organised labour, which was hired by uh, colonial officials. Um, there was no relief fund for the Assam earthquake, it was, there was no charitable relief fund. The, Next earthquake, 1905, Kangra, and what is now Himachal Pradesh in, in North India. At the time, it was one of the, uh, one of the parts of Punjab. Um, there was more significant intervention, uh, but it was really confined mainly to the towns. So Kangra was a plantation area, lots of tea plantations in the Kangra and Kulu valleys. Uh, this is an area of particular interest to Rich, I'm, I'm aware, so uh, I look forward to any more detailed discussions we could have later. Um, but broadly speaking, it was not very urbanized and the extent to which there was state action was concentrated in the towns. And colonial officials reported that they gave out food dolls in the towns, they set up um, field dispensaries and field hospitals to treat injured people. But they did report that people in the countryside, that is Indians in the countryside, generally uh, avoided both the dolls and the medical assistance now, whether that's because it was inadequate or because people were suspicious or it was too far. I don't know. I don't have the records to say that. Uh, but suffice to say, <coughs> the level of intervention was pretty geographically uneven across the area. After the Bogo earthquake in Lower Burma, so this is just north of uh, Yangon or what was then Rangoon, um, there was a much uh, more focused state response, but really concentrated around Bogo town itself. Uh, and to an extent, the outlying villages and a little bit in Yangon, Rangoon itself, which suffered some damage. Uh, so the colonial administration there took responsibility for giving food and shelter to about 5,000 people, which is a substantial number. 
um, over the several months following the earthquake, um, the local uh, official, the senior local official convened a special municipal um, earthquake council which took over local governance and was dissolved after about a year. So there was a change in the mode of governance um, and quite a lot of provision of assistance. Um, importantly, accompanied by a, a national relief fund, which took charitable donations from across India. After the Bihar and Quetta earthquakes, there was um, really what you call a much more major uh, national scale response um, in which the central government and the relevant provincial governments mobilized huge amounts of resources. Uh, the Viceroy of India, the, um, the representative of the British Crown, uh, in both cases set up an international relief fund which took donations from members of the public, businesses, branches of government in India, in Britain and also internationally. Um, so uh, a lot of money, for example, came from Japan for the Bihar earthquake. And for the Quetta Fund, uh, the, the relief fund took donations from foreign governments, including Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, which is a, a little indication of areas of mid-1930s humanitarian internationalism with uh, presumably some quite pointed political overtones. Um, <coughs> all of these earthquakes were pretty different in terms of their physical properties. And it's worth just noting that um, some of these were highland earthquakes, so uh, the Shillong Valley is, um, is elevated and a lot of the damage areas were in the Garo Hills nearby. Uh, Kangra is hilly, um, Bago is uh, riverine plains, as is Bihar. Quetta is an elevated desert valley, um, but this will become important later. A point of contrast between the Bihar earthquake and the Quetta earthquake is that um, Bihar w uh, was and remains a heavily uh, a densely populated, largely agricultural region on the, the Ganges plain, the Ganga plain, uh, which at the time was fairly dependent on sugar cultivation. So large numbers of uh, sugar plantation um, plantations were there to provide an important role in the economy. Uh, so it existed really for strategic reasons. The British had basically founded the town in the 1870s um, as a consequence of one of their many failed invasions of Afghanistan, and it lay across the strategic route to Kandahar. Uh, the population in Quetta was heavily concentrated into Quetta city itself, which was struck very badly by the earthquake. So really in Quetta, the city was leveled, uh, but there was <coughs> Uh, relatively little British responsibility for the territory around that, which was governed by the Khan of Kalat. Uh, whereas in Bihar, it was damaged over a very large area. So few parts of Bihar were as devastated as Quetta City were, but there was a much bigger area to deal with. All of that said, I think we can pick out clear trends over time here. And that also goes for the pattern of long-term relief. So a constant throughout all these earthquakes, which first appeared with the um, uh, Shillong and Kangra earthquakes was a focus on restoring government assets. So basically, official buildings, communications like roads, railways, telegraphs, which governments at any level, so provincial, um, district or municipal, had responsibility for, uh, <coughs> and relatively little intervention into private recovery and private rehabilitation. Uh, and that actually was true of um, the Bago earthquake in Burma in 1930. But this changed markedly in 1934 when the state of the reconstruction process much greater. And then really this came to a head in Quetta, where the uh, where the authorities basically pulled down all the remaining buildings and had the city reconstructed to uh, a, a new building code which was imposed on all private property owners as well as on official buildings. So that's the only instance in which uh, the result of an earthquake was uh, a complete new building code. That didn't happen after any of the others um, for a complex set of reasons to do with who owned land and what special powers different branches of government had. Um, but the point is here we have increasing state intervention in both the short and long terms I read the trend as being stronger in short-term response than in long-term response. So I think, uh, although I, I, I'm aware that I haven't given you all the detail here, but the, the scope and scale of what officials were doing in the days and weeks after earthquakes uh, really ballooned 
after uh, over the course of this time period um, in the immediate term. Uh, and I think this shows us something about the importance of crisis management over longer term development. So what you what we now understand as disaster risk reduction, which depends heavily on preparation and resilience building, um, was not the modus operandi of the colonial state. What we really have is responses to earthquakes much more than forward planning and thinking about future earthquakes, with the limited exceptions of um, <coughs> the building code in Quetta. Schematically, we can group the areas of state action into to two broad and four specific areas. So <clears throat> the colonial administration uh, took material action, firstly, by mobilizing state capacity and resources, that is to say, army, police, district officials, the ability to um, hire private labor and contractors to do work, whether that be rescuing people, supporting people after the earthquakes or reconstructing um, dwellings <clears throat> and through the targeted use of these semi-charitable semi-official relief funds. There are also some important ideological domains which is partly where the dynamic between the colonial government and the nationalists becomes interesting uh, in the realm of ideas and communication. So the colonial government attempted to capture the narrative uh, through the fairly limited public messaging uh, or propaganda means that it had at its disposal during this period, particularly in the 1930s. Uh, and when that failed to control the narrative, where the colonial state faced dissent from Indians, it used repression, coercion. So now let's think about why this change took place. <coughs> After all, somewhat earlier in 1876, when there had been a really major uh, cyclone in Bengal, the colonial state had taken a laissez-faire approach, uh, had refused to do very much proactively to intervene in the, the post-hazard situation. Uh, and what we have, especially by the 1930s, but even the response to the earthquake in Assam in 1897, was significantly more proactive. So where did this come from? And there were three explanations <coughs> which uh, play out at local and uh, global scales. The first, which is somewhat localized, was that the idea of a responsible administration, what a responsible government did, had changed uh, substantially in the 19th century, uh, in the case of India, largely as, as a result of famine. So a, a series of really devastating famines took place uh, across India, north and south, uh, in the second half of the 19th century and, and into the early 20th century. Um, one of the most notorious was in Madras presidency in 1877, depicted in the picture on the left. And the uh, colonial administration, partly due to public outcry in Britain, as much as due to pressure within India, <clears throat> was uh, effectively forced to institute public works relief programs. Um, so giving Indians the opportunity to work uh, for just enough food to sustain themselves. And this uh, normalized the idea of state intervention after disasters. Uh, but there was still a, a good deal of nationalist criticism from the emerging nationalist movement of the, uh, the lackadaisical nature of the state's responses to famine. And so there were repeated series of famine commissions which looked at ways the government could do more. At the same time, uh, smaller scale hazards like flooding, um, so high frequency, um, arguably less sudden impact, um, uh, and certainly usually less devastating uh, hazards like uh, breaching embankments and, uh, and other cyclical flood events um, became integrated into colonial uh, administration. So the Irrigation Service and the Revenue Department both um, played a strong role in predicting and mitigating floods really everywhere, Indus Basin, Ganges Basin, in the Irrawaddy Delta uh, in Lower Burma. So in Burma, for example, there was a, a practice of using the famine relief fund to um, have villagers construct reconstruct embankments as a public work scheme so when villagers were flooded out they'd be able to earn some money to keep themselves going until they could plant a new crop for the next year the logic being that their crops had been washed away and they would um, be subject to starvation if they didn't have work globally there were changing there was a growing idea um, internationally, the earthquakes uh, 
were an object of governance. And this was driven uh, to a great extent by uh, Japan, where from the 1890s through the 1920s, um, large earthquakes uh, became, were posed a challenge to the, the Meiji government's modernization credentials. Uh, and as Greg Clancy has illustrated, uh, the Japanese official response to this was to cast itself as an earthquake nation, where not only did Japan become a, a leader in seismology, but also um, also in social resilience building and, and disaster mitigation measures. Similarly, the 1906 uh, San Francisco earthquake and fire, or at the time it was just called the San, Fris San Francisco fire because the Californian government didn't want to put off uh, potential immigrants from the eastern parts of the US. Um, but of course now we know that the fire was basically a, a consequence of the earthquake. Um, and colonial officials in India were aware of these examples and they understood that governments elsewhere uh, were taking much more proactive stances when it came to natural hazard driven disasters. And then thirdly and finally was the dynamic between the colonial government and Indian nationalists. So as I've trailed, I'm going to focus on this third explanation um, to help us understand why political stability more than change uh, followed on from major hazard driven upheaval. But just before I get into that dynamic, I just uh, want to sense check this idea I have that the nationalist movement at least correlates with the growth of state action. So if we just look, uh, take that schematic diagram I had of the different the four different areas of state action and look at them over time, we can see that this uh, use of state capacity and resources was a constant throughout all the earthquakes. Uh, that the use of major relief funds got going after Begoe and especially through the Bihar and Quetta earthquakes in the 1930s. Uh, that the attempt to capture the narrative, the kind of discursive implications of these earthquakes uh, really only pertained to the, the two mid-30s earthquakes in Bihar and Quetta, for reasons that we'll get into. Uh, and then finally, the use of repression really only appeared after the Quetta earthquake. And if we map <coughs> this change against the growth of the anti-colonial nationalist movement, we'll see there's a correlation. So at the time of the 1897 and 1905 earthquakes, there was no significant nationalist movement of the type that um, we got later in the interwar period. Um, in fact, the Congre earthquake in 1905 took place in April, just a few months before Lord Curzon, the Viceroy, uh, partitioned Bengal, uh, which in many ways was the, kind of the, the spark that lit the fire, to uh, use a hackneyed metaphor, of the nationalist movement. So if it had taken place a year later, it might have become a little more politicized but the point was there were i found no evidence that there was um serious dissent against the colonial government as a result of its management um or at least no evidence that colonial officials were worried about dissent which they did for the later earthquakes <coughs> um, the indian national congress turned into a mass radical movement uh roughly speaking towards the end and after world war one uh, but fortunately for the colonial administration in Burma, its attention was elsewhere in 1930. So um, Bagol was in a largely Burmese region where the Indian National Congress did little to work. Congress was focused in Rangoon and other places which had large uh, immigrant Indian populations. And as I mentioned, the Burmese nationalist movement did not get going in a kind of concerted um, populist way for another few years. At the time of the 1934 earthquake in Bihar, uh, well, this earthquake took place in a Congress heartland. So Rajendra Prashad, who we'll meet shortly, uh, one of the key Congress leaders, uh, a North Bihar landlord, uh, and in general, Bihar was considered a, a politically turbulent region by the colonial state and was one of the places where Congress made early gains. <clears throat> um, and here, as we'll see, the Congress chose to almost form a shadow government in the way it ten, attempted to uh, meet the earthquake. So we'll get into it, but it, it basically sought to meet the government head to head as a disaster responder. And then finally, uh, Congress attempted something similar after Quetta, but um, 
the government didn't let it. So uh, the military prevented any Congress workers from going to Quetta. Uh, and so Congress activity was combined to refugee camps in Punjab and Sindh down on the plains, uh, far from Balochistan, where the earthquake took place. And so in a nutshell, as the nationalist movement grew in importance and in the, uh, the scale of the threat to government legitimacy that it posed, so did the, uh, the kind of size and shape of the government's response. And what this suggests to me is that government action was um, partly undertaken to forestall dissent and to promote legitimacy. Uh, and various historians, including myself, have done work on things other than earthquakes, particularly in the Indian, uh, in the interwar period, which really shows that there was a crisis of colonial legitimacy. And a lot of the, uh, the actions, a lot of the changes in the colonial government's mode of governance tongue twister, uh, were, were really driven by this sense of, uh, by this search for legitimacy. <coughs> okay, one caveat is that, uh, as I've said, the nationalist movement didn't, doesn't appear to have played a large role in the dynamics of the Bago earthquake response. Um, and so I think to a point, government action is partly attributable to these two other logics, which I've mentioned, the sense of a responsible state responding to hazard driven events. Uh, and to save human life and the uh, the growth of uh, international norms relating to earthquakes. Uh, so that's just a slightly sense check what I'm saying and emphasize that this isn't only a story of the nationalist movement and the government. That said, let's see how this dynamic relationship between the two sides played out in three main ways. Firstly, I'll look at relief funds, then I'll look at attempted narrative capture, uh, and as a kind of subsidiary of narrative capture, I'll think about ideas about nature. And really the message I want to get across here is that there were important shared priorities, shared ideas and values, which both sides had, um, which limited the fallout and tended to prompt uh, cooperation rather than contestation in a lot of contexts. So here's Gandhi again, leading the salt march again, because it's a basically a, a very visually attractive uh, event, so it's easy to find good pictures of. I've mentioned that by the 1930s, <coughs> the Indian National Congress had transformed itself from basically an elite talking shop, which had a basically loyalist stance to the colonial administration, um, to a mass movement which was radical, demanded uh, independence from Britain rather than progressive constitutional reforms. Uh, and in this, this was in the context by the 1930s of the global financial crisis, um, something we can probably sympathize with today, uh, which again really undermined a lot of the uh, credibility that the colonial administration had previously claimed uh, as a manager of the Indian economy. <coughs> so lots of scholars have written about this period as, as a period of generalized challenge to a colonial rule as particularly represented by the Congress and other anti-colonial groups. And it is worth noting that uh, there's a marked change in tone of the way officials thought about or at least talked about their responses to these earthquakes in um, confidential official correspondence. So I haven't found anything in uh, the records for the Assam or Kangra earthquakes and with the Kangra earthquake I, I managed to get quite a lot of um, non-published correspondence, less so for Assam. Uh, but after the Kangra earthquake, there's no real sense that <coughs> uh, they, there's likely to be any political fallout from the event. Uh, in fact, after the Assam earthquake, there were um, some rumblings about the fact that there was a jubilee collection being held at the same time and that it would be unseemly to hold uh, a celebration of the British royal family when Indians were suffering. But uh, that was about it. Um, after Kangra, no sense that there would be serious political agitation. Um, after the Lower Burma earthquake, <coughs> the government in Burma had begun to worry a little bit about uh, so-called disloyalty or so-called troublemakers. Um, and the governor of Burma noted, for example, that a couple of Buddhist monks were going around the countryside uh, saying that the Burmese people deserved this earthquake because they'd um, accepted something called diarchy, which was a, a split of responsibilities between um, provincial governments and the central government, which was designed to uh, give some better representation to uh, Indian uh, communities, Indian 
publics, uh, but was very unpopular in Burma. <clears throat> um, but then after the Bihar earthquake, the, the Home Department of the central government issued direct instructions to the provincial government not to allow agitators to use the post-earthquake situation to try and foment dissent and agitation against the government. Um, and the governor of Bihar, like all provincial governors, submitted fortnightly reports on political activities uh, and for several months kept track of who was saying what in Bihar that could be seen as um, attempts to promote anti, an anti-government agenda. <coughs> so there's a, a real marked change in, in the, the way that the colonial government thought about nationalist activity and indeed I think it's safe to say the scale of uh, nationalist activity as well. In light of this, the government was extraordinarily fortunate that what the Congress actually chose to do after 1934 in Bihar was to present itself as a government in waiting by becoming a proactive responder to the earthquake. So very explicitly, instead of mounting political agitation against the government, which by this point the Congress was uh, very experienced at, had led several All India mass campaigns which had seriously disrupted colonial government right from the end of World War I up to the, uh, actually the period just before the earthquake. Um, but what the Congress leadership chose to do was focus on cooperation with the government and uh, <coughs> demonstrating its credentials as a governing um, authority itself, or, or at least as an organisation that could manage the logistics of this, uh, this, major, uh, this major emergency situation. Um, so the Congress formed a Bihar Central Relief Committee, which was spearheaded by um, Rajendra Prashad, uh, who, as I mentioned, was a Congress bigwig and a, North, a prominent North Bihar landlord. Uh, the Congress mounted, mounted its own uh, fundraising campaign, which I'll get to later, um, undertook direct relief work and salvage in the villages, um, organised the clearing of wells, uh, gave uh, shelter, built and ran transitional shelters, um, basically all the same kinds of activities that the state was doing, but in cooperation with local officials. And so Prasad and um, Gandhi both uh, instructed local Congress workers to cooperate. And uh, although there's some evidence from the kind of operational level, um, oral histories recorded by one Congress worker, for example, noted that there was a bit of friction between him and his uh, Congress colleagues and local officials who had control over uh, motor vehicle resources. Um, but actually, by all accounts, the two sides got on pretty well and the uh, government official reporting on the earthquake mentioned several times that the Congress uh, cooperated. Uh, so they really can't avoid acknowledging that there was uh, serious work going on from the Congress side. <coughs> And the effect of the Congress's participation, uh, its cooperative participation, uh, was to give it a platform to, pre to present itself in a certain way. Uh, and we can see the result of this uh, in examples like the image on the left here, <clears throat> which is an article which Prasad, and as you can see, this uh, photo on the right is Prasad is a much older man, so he's, he's pretty young at the point this article comes out. Um, uh, Prasad wrote this article about the reconstruction of Bihar putting forward the, the Congress narrative uh, of what they did and why. And this appeared in the same publication, uh, which was organized by a newspaper, the Calcutta Statesman, uh, as articles by the governor of Bihar, Sir James Sifton, uh, and by the Viceroy and by various other official and semi-official figures. <clears throat> so I don't want to over egg this pudding, uh, but to a point, Congress was able to gain a voice at the same table as colonial administrators. So in the post-earthquake situation, it was able to assert its own legitimacy as an important uh, humanitarian actor. Let's go on now to look uh, at the other um, material domain I've noted, which is the targeted use of relief funds. So I'll just pause a moment to give some backgrounds on background on these funds. Um, <clears throat> these were ostensibly charitable funds, so as I said, uh, they were set up by 
senior government officials, but they took donations largely from private citizens as well as from various branches of government, um, businesses and so on, as well as foreign governments. Uh, but the way they were actually managed was through committees that had heavy official representation. Officials would periodically and disingenuously claim that the funds did not uh, were not government entities and didn't serve the government, but actually officials exercised a lot of control in shaping uh, who got what and why, so they helped set the priorities. These funds were big. Um, the Bihar official fund raised about 6 million rupees, divided among some 2,000 heads of household. The Quetta fund was smaller, so only a, a million rupees, uh, but was distribu distributed among significantly fewer people, about 26,000 in all. <coughs> and they had very, uh, I should say, the, the funds were big and complex and uh, served lots of people. But I'm just going to pick out a couple of key features of each fund just to demonstrate the extent to which these uh, mirrored government priorities. Um, so the Bihar Fund had special allocations uh, for two categories. Firstly, for middle class sufferers. And there was a persistent um, discourse, uh, with the exception of Quetta. Uh, but in most of the earthquakes, there was a persistent idea that the middle classes had suffered the most. Um, and you can see this headline from the major uh, sort of mainstream publication, Times of India, middle classes worst hit. Um, and the basic idea was that poor people lived in uh, small, lightly built houses, often mud or bamboo, <coughs> which were um, fairly light, so they're much less likely to kill you if they fell on you, and also were cheap to reconstruct. Basically, the idea was people who didn't have much property didn't have that much to lose from an earthquake, which Primarily, primarily destroys property. Uh, and this was just as true in Bihar as it was in Assam uh, some years earlier. <coughs> now, the Bihar Official Relief Fund made special allocations to middle class survivors uh, for hiring labour to reconstruct their houses. And the logic was this poor people would reconstruct their houses themselves and that was fine so they didn't need they just needed money for materials they didn't need any um, any money to pay labor whereas middle class people would lose their social status if they undertook manual labor themselves it, um, it would breach various um, social taboos and so these people deserved higher allocations of money in order to preserve their social standing and what this very obviously does is attempt to preserve the pre-existing socio-economic status quo. <laughs> so this is, uh, if you like, the opposite of build back better in terms of class equality. This is build back to as near the previous situation as you can. Uh, similarly, the relief fund provided paid special attention to the sugar economy. I mentioned earlier that uh, Bihar was home to many sugar plantations. Previously it was indigo, it became sugar later on uh, when indigo, the global indigo market collapsed. Um, and these uh, plantations were often owned by Europeans, often managed by Europeans, so it served racialized as well as class interests. <coughs> and so the Relief Fund did uh, various activities like um, try to find ways to process sugarcane. Oh, I've got a picture actually of, um, of sand, sand which came out of vents lying on, um, on uh, sugarcane crop fields. So, uh, the fund provided for clearing the sand from the field so that the cane could be harvested for processing and crushing the cane, uh, partly by transporting it to factories outside the damaged zone, partly by trying to reintroduce uh, previous sort of pre-plantation agriculture methods of sugarcane crushing. Uh, so this was really geared towards the economic recovery, uh, again in a way that uh, benefited the social status quo, the, the economic status quo. <coughs> After the Quetta earthquake, the uh, fund was set up with the explicit uh, desire to restore a person to their status in life, uh, but not improve it. So uh, as one report uh, put it, uh, a hotel owner was given a hotel, a Tonga driver, that is to say a horse-drawn um, buggy driver, was given a new horse and a new Tonga, but not the owner was given that, but not the driver. So nobody should be seen to improve their status through the use of these relief funds. There was, however, a huge amount of racial bias, again, very explicit this time, racial bias in the Quetta Fund. 
Um, because Quetta was a garrison town and a hill station, and the earthquake happened in summer, so there were lots of uh, white Europeans there, white British there who were termed Europeans in uh, colonial lingo. Um, they were given uh, much more uh, help proportionately compared with Indian survivors. Um, so a ship, the SS Karanja, was specially chartered to take survivors from Karachi back to Britain and uh, British survivors uh, continued to be supported by the fund while they were in Britain. Some of them even got passage back to India sometime later when they wanted to go and restart their colonial lives. Uh, when it turned out there was a bit of money left over from all this, the government also uh, put some special money towards civil servants, so Indian subordinate servants of the government in the area. Again, this uh, really attempts to shore up colonial power and to reward a key class of collaborators. Um, and, and I think actually often we tend to overlook the importance of uh, Indian domicile-silled British Europeans uh, as a class of collaborators in the colonial administration. <coughs> so colonial governance relied not only on a kind of intermediary elite Indian layer to govern the country, but also on uh, official and non-official British people as well. So of course there are some differences between these two uses of the relief funds. Uh, the protection of um, government collaborators as opposed to the middle classes more broadly is much more naked after Quetta. But in both uh, cases we have an attempt to restore the social and economic status quo, which we can read pretty neatly, I think, as an attempt to restore the political status quo on sure up state authority. <coughs> so what did the Congress-led relief fund do? Well, I mentioned there was a Congress fund for Bihar. It raised about three million rupees by the end of November, so half the size of the government-sponsored fund, but bear in mind the government-sponsored fund was able to appeal directly to foreign governments to mount um, publicity campaigns across India and in Britain. The Congress fund had to, to work with its own resources in the first place. Uh, <coughs> so this is a really impressive amount of money that they gathered. Um, and similarly to the uh, similarly to the official fund, the Congress partly prioritised the middle classes. So this was the decision that was taken by August, um, and I've got the same headline from the Times of India just to demonstrate that there was a, a wider spread uh, assumption, certainly in elite circles, in what is often called the Anglosphere, so the English-speaking Indian and European sphere in India, <coughs> that the middle classes were worst hit. And uh, Gandhi and Prasad both um, both made speeches highlighting the particular suffering of the middle classes and that they deserved help. And uh, so by August, the Congress had drawn up a list of middle class families in Bihar who needed special assistance. Um, Gandhi also made some speeches about the poor deserving assistance, but he spoke more about the middle classes as far as I know. So although the Congress was, was a nationalist movement which sought overall to displace the colonial government, uh, they shared some pretty important social values, or at least the ascendant leadership in the Congress did. Uh, and this is an important nuance to add here. The photo on the left here depicts Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, a Congress leader, later India's first prime minister after independence, and Mohandas Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, very broadly speaking, Nehru was associated with the left wing of the Congress, more inclined towards socialism. Gandhi uh, and Prasad were associated with the right wing of Congress, closer to business, uh, more capitalist friendly. <coughs> and it just so happened that at the time of the Bihar earthquake, the right wing of Congress was in the ascendant in the working committee. Um, and of course, Prasad being on site in Bihar was able to exercise a, a large degree of influence over the, uh, the regional Congress response. Uh, Nehru was imprisoned for unrelated reasons uh, shortly after the Bihar earthquake um, <coughs> and was therefore unable to seriously influence the nature of the Congress response. And it is possible that if Nehru was on the scene, things might have turned out a little bit differently. But as it was, the dynamic between Congress and the government remained productive in the use of relief funds as well as in on the ground cooperation in terms of setting up survivor camps. So now I'll come on to the, the narrative angle <coughs> and think about discourse a little bit. 
The earthquakes, particularly in the 1930s in the face of this crisis of legitimacy, offered colonial officials an opportunity to project an image of what an earthquake was and how and why the state responded to it. And so there was a reasonably concerted effort to put forward narratives of, uh, in a nutshell, how great the government was in its earthquake response um, after uh, particularly the Bihar and Quetta earthquakes. I haven't found equivalents for the earlier earthquakes, which again, I think goes to the, the kind of importance of the nationalist challenge in these two instances. And uh, to kind of crudely summarize, the narrative went like this. Society was getting on with life. The earthquake came, disrupted everything. People were helpless. Officials came in and saved them. And there are pretty explicit quotes, which I'll use to illustrate this. So the report on the left by W.B. Brett, William Bailey Brett, the relief commissioner that the Bihar government appointed to take charge of uh, relief measures, wrote in his published report, the wholesale destruction and the terrifying phenomena which accompanied the earthquake left the mass of people stunned and dazed. The officers of government took immediate and effective charge of the situation. Now, after the Quetta earthquake, there were loads of these, well, not loads, but there were several of these uh, reports. So there's not one kind of single authoritative equivalent to Brett, but to illustrate with quotes from a couple of them, survivors were pouring out of the city, not knowing where to go or what to do. And then uh, a similar story in another pamphlet concludes, luckily 12,000 able-bodied disciplined troops were ready to leap to any command. In other words, as I've said, the earthquakes uh, destroyed people's capacity to shift for themselves, so the government had to do it for them. And this played into all kinds of stereotypes about um, the supposed lack of dynamism in Indian societies, <coughs> people's dependence on the state. I mean, the, the version you hear uh, is colonial officials say that they were mom, bap, or mother and father uh, to villagers. Uh, and this really goes to a, a long and <laughs> dearly held uh, belief that the average Indian, in inverted commas, was loyal and well disposed towards the British government. Um, and it was only a few rabble rousing agitators in the Congress that were mucking things up. Um, by the later 1930s and 1940s, by the way, a lot of the British uh, administrators, particularly the younger ones, no longer thought this uh, and were much more sympathetic to the nationalist movement. But still, we're talking the public narrative here and, and what was said in public. So these accounts were, of course, hugely selective. Um, one of the reports on Quetta even says outright in the foreword that the government received so much help from volunteer organisations that it would be impossible to record them all. So it just disregards them. But the point is these publications, which were circulated um, to the public, gave the impression that the government was doing all of the meaningful action. It put agency in the hands of the government. Um, these uh, publications probably had a very limited circulation. At least one of the post Quetta pamphlets was produced, as far as I can make out, explicitly for members of the Legislative Assembly, because there was a debate coming up about the government's handling of the earthquake. Um, they were all available in government bookshops, which were in major cities in India and Burma. <coughs> uh, but the colonial state in this period, in the interwar period, didn't have a, a kind of large and well-functioning propaganda machinery. So it had had a bit of one in World War I, which was then dismantled uh, because of largely ideological reasons. Um, it was thought to not be very British to uh, try and influence the public that the works of government should stand for themselves. Um, and then in the World War II period, when there was a huge recruitment drive, the public information system in India was kind of uh, reconstructed and, and continued and formed the basis of the post-colonial South Asian states public messaging capacities. But the point is, in the 1930s, they had quite limited capacity to try and put forward a narrative. So I don't want to give the impression that um, this story was being told in every home. But because the senior Congress leadership uh, and the politically important uh, middle and upper classes in India were largely conversant in English, uh, and because these government reports were picked up and uh, reproduced in uh, much of the Anglophone press, uh, and according to some reports in uh, sections of the vernacular press, <coughs> um, the idea was to to put across this idea of the uh, excuse me, the idea was to try and promote this image of the government as a really active force and as 
a responsible reactor to disasters. This narrative, and this is where my environmental history hat gets firmly on my head, this narrative uh, depended very heavily on a specific idea about the nature of earthquakes, which was that they were fundamentally natural disasters. They were considered exogenous shocks that came from outside society from a potentially hostile nature. They were sudden, they happened like that, no one could see them coming. All you could do was react to them. Uh, and this runs through uh, colonial discourse, partly because of the very important role that the Geological Survey of India played in talking in public about earthquakes, um, thinking about uh, resilience building measures which were generally not implemented, uh, and surveying the damage and writing up reports, which uh, I would argue allocated earthquakes to the domain primarily of science, <coughs> but also in uh, speeches and discourse uh, that was more explicitly politically framed. So a week after the Bihar earthquake, the governor of the province, uh, James Sifton, gave a speech in Patna, uh, where he reminded the audience that they just shared the experience uh, of a time when the forces of nature appeared to break out of control. Uh, and then the, my, actually my favorite quote about colonial earthquakes is from this pamphlet about the Quetta earthquake, a government pamphlet, that at three minutes past 3 a.m. on the morning of the 31st of May 1935, the irresistible process of geological evolution caught Quetta by the throat, shook her for 25 vicious seconds and left her dead. The rest of the pamphlet then goes on to tell the story, of course, about how uh, the state came in to save the, the poor people whom nature had so damaged. Now, government discourses were challenged. Nehru, in particular, in the brief period after the Bihar earthquake where he was out of prison, uh, did tour Bihar, he gave speeches there and he gave speeches elsewhere in Uttar, um, what is now Uttar Pradesh and the United Provinces, where he criticized the government um, and quite presciently draw a contrast between what he called its lethargic response to the Bihar earthquake where, with the way the government um, leapt to action whenever it thought its core interests were, were threatened, in other words, to meet what colonial officials regarded as, um, uh, as anti-colonial agitation. But I've already mentioned that Nehru was in and out of prison in this period. Prasad and Gandhi were very strong on the cooperative messaging. Um, and they really controlled the, the official versions of the Congress narrative. And Nehru's line got limited traction here. I've already spoken about shared class assumptions between the government and the Congress, but there's a, a really interesting shared uh, strain of shared ideas about the environment. Um, so <clears throat> many Indians did not hold the kind of mechanistic, naturalistic understanding of earthquakes which the colonial officials had, which the GSI promulgated. Um, and there's a famous example of a debate between Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore, uh, the, the Bengal poet, about the 1934 earthquake and its moral meaning. Uh, and this is often sort of mischaracterized as uh, a simple case of Gandhi being superstitious and Tagore being rational and scientific. It's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, but very broadly speaking, the point is that Indians weren't necessarily predisposed towards naturalistic explanations uh, and there were lots of examples, Elena Markson again has done work on this, um, of people um, talking about earthquakes in terms of astrology, the alignment of heavenly bodies. Um, in Nepal actually uh, there's uh, somewhat unsurprisingly a huge amount of um, uh, religious or spiritual interpretations of what the earthquake was and how it worked. Uh, which was embedded in state discourse because the Rana government had uh, uh, sort of Hindu credentials, uh, but I can't quite get into that at the moment. Anyway, the point is, there was also a substantial discourse, um, again, emanating from Prasad and people around him, which was naturalistic. So in his address, his presidential address to the 1934 Congress in Bombay, a few months after the Bihar earthquake, Prasad said that Bihar had been particularly selected as the victim of nature's wrath um, and used the earthquake to talk about the way national, the, the nation had come together, that people had traveled in from across India to help, that people had sent donations, and that this showed how, how far national consciousness had grown, how much youthful energy there was in the Indian people. He didn't use it to criticize the British government. He then used the remainder of the speech, this was a little preface at the beginning, and the remainder of the speech 
he spent taking down um, a, a set of constitutional proposals which the UK Parliament had issued. So there's no way in which we should read the Congress and its approach to earthquakes as a sign of loyalism or lack of opposition to the government. It's just that earthquakes were not the terrain that the, the Congress chose to, to use to oppose the government. <coughs> and uh, I won't give the examples now because, because of time considerations, but um, other Congress publications put forward very similar points about the earthquake. So now I'll come on to a, a fairly short part four, just to note what happened when this dynamic, this productive dynamic uh, between the Congress and the government broke down. And this happened sharply in the wake of the Quetta earthquake in 1935. The, the, theograph, the theoretical or scholarly framing of this is that uh, there's work in social sciences in DRR on the extent to which um, repression, authoritarian governments increase their use of uh, oppression uh, and coercion after um, natural hazards. And I'm showing that although the colonial government had many features that we might call authoritarian, um, Quetta was the only instance in which repression actually increased. Uh, and I, I would say this is because Quetta was the only earthquake that generated an openly political crisis. So it really isn't the earthquake that causes the repression, but the political fallout, <laughs> which is highly contingent on who does what in the wake of an earthquake. As we'll see now, the uh, colonial government effectively brought this on itself. So a little bit of context on Quetta. I mentioned that it's a garrison town uh, up there in what is now uh, Western Pakistan, Balochistan province. Uh, at the time, this was the northwest frontier of India. Uh, Quetta, uh, actually the, the location of Quetta was leased by the British from the Khan of Kalat. So it was under British control, but um, strictly speaking was Kalat territory. <coughs> and the areas around Quetta were, were princely, so they were they belonged to the Khan and the, the mainly Pashtun inhabitants rather than to the British. Uh, the earthquake was smaller in magnitude than some of the others but happened very close to Quetta uh, and um, really leveled the city, so killed about 30,000 people according to the best estimates I've got. Um, for a combination of um, sort of social and topographical reasons, local geological reasons, the cantonment, which was in the north part of the city, northwest of the city, escaped the worst of the shaking and buildings in the cantonment and in what's called the civil lines um, were anyway much better built, so they were less likely to fall over. And the majority of the damage and the mortality happened in the city or the bazaar, uh, which is not even depicted on this map, uh, but is south of the civil station. Uh, so in a nutshell, Europeans and particularly the army, and actually to be fair, the army units who were posted there were both British and Indian regiments, so there were lots of Indian soldiers as well as Brits, uh, but they survived relatively unharmed. The air force didn't, the police force didn't, the civil administration in general was actually severely damaged. And uh, one of the upshots of this was that the local civilian administrator handed over uh, power to the local army commander, General Carslake, uh, who declared martial law uh, and <coughs> took full charge of the post-disaster situation. Uh, troops rapidly started digging uh, for survivors and for property. Uh, unfortunately, initially in the civil station in the, the European parts of town, um, and there would be lots of discussion afterwards about the extent to which the army was negligent of Indian survivors uh, and potential Indian survivors. The authorities imposed a controversial cordon, which are called the cordon sanitaire around the city. The ostensible justification was that uh, there were so many um, dead bodies in the city that there was a risk of disease if people went into the area. Uh, this explanation was never accepted by nationalists because it seemed um, it seems suspicious that the government also refused any requests from uh, Congress leaders uh, and in fact anyone at all from outside the area to go to Quetta. So what the army instead did was evacuate, in some cases forcibly, about 31,000 survivors over the following two weeks and set up refugee camps, displaced people's camps, on the plains in Punjab and Sindh. <coughs> so martial law here lasted um, for about three and a half weeks. <coughs> 
but the, when the civil administration took back over, it retained emergency powers for a long time. So this really is a Gambon state of exception in, in pretty stark terms. Now, partly because nationalists weren't allowed to go and participate, and partly because uh, there were lots of accusations that the, the army had been incompetent or negligent or, or racist in the way it um, treated the rescue and relief operations, uh, there was a lot of press criticism of the government response. <coughs> and the government used coercive legislation, uh, the Press Controls Act, to fine newspapers to try and force some of them to close down, uh, and generally to uh, try and ban dissent. And going through the stories that the government considered uh, were harmful, so very few of them seem wildly unbalanced to me with a kind of present day uh, reading eye. But there's uh, good research that show not by me, uh, but scholarship shows that the colonial government was extremely sensitive to criticism from Indians, particularly after the 1857 um, uh, conflict, variously called the first Indian War of Independence or the Great Mutiny, depending on your ideological preferences, <coughs> um, which basically read a lack of love for the British government as a sign of disloyalty, of, of agitation, of uh, bad intentions or of hostile intentions. Uh, and so this really underpinned the way that they interpreted any criticism of the government relief effort. Now, it's important to distinguish here. So many of you will have heard of the, the terrible massacre at Amritsa. Kim Wagner's recent book on that, by the way, is absolutely excellent, um, of 1919 which was a, a major example of uh, colonial mass murder of Indians. We're not talking the same kind of repression. <coughs> so as far as I know, the colonial government didn't send anyone to prison. It didn't execute anybody for dissent around the Quetta earthquake, but it did use press controls uh, and sort of softer co forms of coercion to try and again, control the public narrative, which for me really demonstrates that the foundational aim of a lot of government activities after these earthquakes was to preserve state power. Despite this, although there was an intense period of contestation around the narratives of the Quetta earthquake, it actually disappeared very quickly from uh, the nationalist press as far as I can make out. And in fact, it never gained that kind of all India traction. The things that really um, spurred mass movements for nationalists uh, were all India issues. They were, they were generalized social and governance issues. So the Rolat Act, uh, which produced the, the Rolat Satyagraha, one of Gandhi's first uh, mass campaigns after World War II, the Khilafat movement, which had a uh, Muslim and uh, some Congress collaboration in the early 1920s, and then uh, at the other end of the period, uh, the huge repression that the government used during World War II to squash dissent there, all produced huge reactions in ways that the Quetta earthquake didn't. So I'll come on to my conclusions before going over to some putative potential lessons for present day earthquake management or, or how we should rather, not practical lessons, but how we should think about the politics of natural uh, hazard driven disasters. <coughs> So to rattle through this rather quickly, the, we've seen that the growth of the nationalist movement correlated with an intensifying state response in part one. We've seen that shared values um, about who should get relief and recovery resources and about the nature of earthquakes, literally nature, the environmental base of earthquakes tended to limit the political fallout after most of the earthquakes, except in the case of the Quetta one. Um, but I think it's really important to stress here the contingencies of these political outcomes. So it wasn't that earthquakes can't produce social change or political change, but that the key actors in these situations were choosing to collaborate in most of the uh, in most of the examples. Uh, and I didn't go into the Arya Samaj's role after the Kangra earthquake in 1905, but volunteer non-official organizations were involved after all of these earthquakes and accepting Quetta, they always cooperated closely with uh, officials. Um, However, we've also seen, again, in the spirit of contingency, that uh, where the spirit of collaboration uh, was absent, earthquakes, um, uh, earthquakes could prompt repression. So there's, if you like, there's no kind of single uh, outcome for an earthquake, even in the very similar uh, 
temporal and contextual setting of two earthquakes that happened just one year apart in colonial India, the, the political outcomes were really different. And this leads me to my suggested lessons for today. And there's a question mark here because I'm not an expert on present day uh, disaster management. Uh, and these are really things I'm throwing out there and I'd love to discuss in the Q&A rather than kind of definitive implications that uh, people should take and try to implement. So firstly, as I've just indicated, context is very nearly everything when it comes to interpreting uh, disaster politics. I've talked about the contingency of what the Congress was up to and who was in charge and the colonial states priorities at different times. I'd also note that what I've been discussing here were, uh, I mean, they were, they were really major natural hazards, but they took place in the enormous polity of colonial India. And the lessons we might draw from uh, another example of a major hazard, say the Haiti earthquake, uh, might read very differently if you look at the politics. I don't know much about the Haiti earthquake, but it's just a random example. Certainly uh, a famous example of terrible political fallout from a major hazard driven disaster is uh, Sri Lanka after the 2004 tsunami uh, and the tsunami relief phases role in reigniting the, the civil war there. Um, <coughs> so I think citizens' expectations is, is a major thing we should consider when trying to use history to read across to present day situations. The growth of the assumption that the state could and should do something about disaster situations was really important in driving the colonial state's response. Uh, and those expectations, I would assume, are now much higher um, today than they used to be uh, even in the 1930s. So there are probably important differences and limits to how far we can use history. But I would suggest that we shouldn't necessarily expect major political change after earthquakes. Uh, and although I promise not to talk about DRR theory, there is a debate in DRR theory about the extent to which earthquakes tend to cause or catalyze political change. Um, and even people who've promoted the idea of the critical juncture uh, have tended to find that uh, they didn't occur in the specific case studies that um, scholars have looked at. And I would suggest actually we should think much more about collaboration and about the, the stakes that different actors after earthquakes or after major disasters have in trying to restore the status quo ante. So I think all that's left for me to do is say thank you uh, and I look forward to the q and I'll stop sharing my screen at this point and come back to, here we are. Thank you, Dan. Uh, really inspiring. And certainly in my own head, it, it's posed quite a lot of questions and, and sort of reflections. But I, I'm, I'm aware there's a, a fair number of questions that have been sort of posted. So um, the one that just the most recent one that struck me is somebody who's actually a resident of Quetta. And they said, our grandparents always shared how massive the 1935 earthquake was. Mm. Uh, mostly the discussion was around the changing building codes post-1935. There's always been this paranoia. Whenever Quetta is hit by an earthquake, every earthquake was compared to the 1935 earthquake. It just shows how big of an aftershock the earthquake was left. So that, that was an observation by one of the audience members. So I think that comes back to your points about the, the need to contextualise and look backwards in, in, the, in order that we can manage the current day as well and going forward. But, but in terms of questions, we had one a question from the audience and they said, my question is how important is the historical perspective in the contemporary disaster risk uh, planning in the Himalayan region and the greater Asian region? So quite a large question for you there. Um, well, just to, to note, firstly, uh, whoever posted the thing about um, Quetta-based grandparents, I would love to talk to you offline if you care to get in touch with me. Uh, I think my email address is pretty readily available. Uh, so do get in touch if you'd like to chat. I'd be fascinated to hear those stories. <coughs> um, as to the, the historical perspective in present day uh, earthquake management in the Himalaya, there are two basic ways to think about this. One of which is uh, from the natural science angle and the extent to which historical research can be actually quite important for scientists trying to, uh, trying to understand the physical properties of the Himalaya. Uh, in a nutshell, good instrumental records only go back a, a little over 100 years 
um, and earthquakes typically have long return periods, especially for major earthquakes. So if you want to estimate the likelihood of hazard occurring in any place, you need historical records as well as instrumental records to get a good handle on it. <clears throat> as for the extent to which the kind of social or political history of these earthquakes informs the present day, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on um, on this and I, I would also just mention that I haven't done any collaborative work with the Indian or Pakistani or in, indeed Nepali disaster management organisations. Uh, I know that NSET, my partner on the project, were interested in talking to me precisely because they felt that uh, the historical dimensions of Nepal's vulnerability to earthquakes doesn't generally get enough attention. So I would venture to say that people probably don't think a lot about history uh, at the level of sort of major major NGOs, major civil society organisations, international responders uh, and government agencies. I dare say that people who live in places which experience frequent earthquakes are much more likely to have family memory and community social memory of them, uh, which may well be very important. It's not the kind of research I've done. Uh, but it is worth noting, even in those cases, uh, I'd be surprised if people, with the possible exception of Quetta, where it was such a kind of signal event in the city's history, um, really use historical memory of uh, such old earthquakes. Uh, and in fact, I'm told that NSET was founded in uh, after the 1988 earthquake in Kathmandu, uh, because that was a wake up call to earthquake engineers and others who lived in Nepal. Uh, at how vulnerable Nepal was. Um, but that is notably not the major 1934 earthquake, the great um, Nepal earthquake of 1934, nor the 1833 earthquake uh, which hit Kathmandu, which was also really severe. So although Kathmandu had really lived through a lot of very severe earthquakes in the modern period, it wasn't until a medium-sized earthquake in the 80s, which did enough damage to, to give people a, a shock, Ha ha. Uh, but did enough people damage give people uh, like a serious shock, a wake up call, um, but not so much that everyone was just preoccupied on trying to rebuild and, and survive, that it produced uh, this kind of substantial institutional change. Thank you, Dan. We've, we've also had a question from one of my colleagues, Heather, which you may wish to pose your question. Um, hello. Um, yeah, so I was actually asking a question uh, which I think might be helpful to students as well, which was uh, thinking about the uh, research um, methods type, side of things in terms of using the archives. And if you, uh, so there's quite a few of our students in the audience, some, some might be using archives for various different uh, reasons for dissertation research. And I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate from your experience, some of the advantages and drawbacks of using archives, that, that would be in relation both to the uh, disaster side and actually how those were measured, but also for understanding some of the biases you talked about in relation to um, race and class. Mm. So the, both the social side as well as the environmental side, I guess. Well, archives are amazing because they have a huge amount information and they're super irritating so you want for any given project. Um, if anyone is interested in um, a sort of historical geography approach to these earthquakes, um, the Indian National Archives has an online platform called Abhilek Patel, which is, uh, is pretty good. They've got a fair amount of stuff digitized. It's reasonably user friendly. Uh, it's free. So I definitely recommend that because a lot of that material hasn't been extensively used. If you can get to the British Library, there's plenty of stuff there. Um, but this is all basically official correspondence. And if you want to look at what ordinary people thought and felt, you have to go out um, The Mission Archive in Birmingham has a lot of material. So a few ways that I found good source material in English that talks about people's experiences more than about um, uh, the kind of management and response. For anyone who's interested in the physical properties of the hazards, <clears throat> uh, you don't necessarily need to do archives because the GSI have done it for you. So each of these earthquakes, with the exception of the Bago earthquake, which I, I've never, never found the report if there was one, um, the GSI 
produced a fairly comprehensive report on their understanding of the, the physical science basis of the earthquakes are in each case. Um, and seismologists that I've worked with still read, uh, particularly Oldham's report on the 1897 earthquake uh, as a kind of, not just a landmark next in the history of seismology, but something that contains useful, important information. I don't know, I, I could go on, but uh, I'm aware <laughs> this could get a bit into the weeds. Oh. Thank you. I think there's a few other questions as well. So, thank you for that. Thank you both. Uh, perhaps we can open um, it to the audience. If anybody else has a question they've not written or would like to pose a question, please please feel free to speak, but be aware you will be on the recording. Otherwise, type it in the Q and A. Okay, well, perhaps while people are thinking, um, one of my initial questions, oh, we've, someone's raised a hand. Is yeah, this, sorry, uh, Rich, you missed Camilla's question, on, which is on the list okay, in please. the Q&A. Okay, please, Camilla, please. You're muted. Sorry, we can't hear you, you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? We can. Hello. It's actually Google permissions. Um, anyway, there we go. That's fine. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dan. That was super interesting. Um, I had, well, lots of questions, but I don't want to take up all the time. Um, I guess my, my first one was around um, whether you've studied any of the, the later earthquakes, and, and particularly the 1945 earthquake offshore Baluchistan, um, and whether you had any observations about the responses to that, because I guess that comes at a pretty interesting point in the um, yeah, collapse of the colonial government. So I would be interested in, in hearing what you think about that or whether you yeah, have had any investigations in that. Um, um, thanks, Camilla. The short answer is no, not much. Uh, I haven't found much in the way of, ar of archival sources, which is a big part of it. Um, I also understand that as experienced by people on land, that was la that largely came in the shape of a tsunami and it hit the Makran coast, which was, and with the exception of Guadalajara, remains pretty sparsely populated. Uh, it also wasn't in British territory. So this was, unless I'm mistaken, the Khan of Kalats territory or, or another Baloch um, <clears throat> chieftain. So the British government didn't have responsibility for acting there. And as far as I know, didn't mount a major response. So after Quetta in 1935, uh, as a kind of secondary consideration, the colonial authorities did uh, go out to Kalat villages uh, to try and distribute relief. I don't know that they did anything equivalent in 1945. Probably didn't have the capacity or the interest, frankly, because um, they were dealing with the fallout from World War II and uh, getting ready for imminent decolonization. Cool, thank you. I'll let other people ask their questions rather than asking my second one. Thank you. I'm reading one now from the audience. It says, I have a question relating to the 1897 Assam earthquakes. Politically, in colonial times, what was the response from the government after that earthquake? It can be viewed in different ways, in the sense that how much did it impact the place demographically, geographically and politically? I wonder if I can ask a question for clarification. Um, are you asking about, what do you mean by politics? Would be my question to that questionnaire. Um, because there was, there were few avenues for what we would typically recognize as politics in Assam at the time. Uh, there was virtually no representative, there were virtually no local representative structures. Um, there was no serious nationalist movement at the time. I didn't find any records of agitation or things that the government would consider political. Uh, but with a broader definition of politics, we might be thinking about governance. And I noticed that you mentioned demographics there. Is the questioner around? Would they like to expand? They're very welcome to do so, Dan, um, but there's, there's no written text at the moment. OK, <clears throat> well, in that case, I'll basically say that I found very little evidence of 
things that the colonial administration thought were political. Uh, the 1897 earthquake's been really frustrating to research actually because I just haven't found um, correspondence really. So for the Quetta earthquake I managed to get hold of um, the deputy commissioner's tour diaries and um, correspondence between the, the Punjab government and the centre uh, outlining in sort of blow by blow detail what happened after the earthquake. But for 1897, I haven't been able to turn anything up um, in London or in, in Delhi. Uh, possibly if I'd done more serious research in Assam itself, in Guwahati, I might have got further, but that wasn't within my capacity for this project. Um, the main thing we might call political, as far as I know, was that um, disquiet over the optics um, <coughs> of trying to raise funds for the Jubilee celebrations, for the Royal Jubilee celebrations, when India had just suffered this, and particularly when Assam had suffered it. Um, we might note that one of the kind of interesting features of Assam is it had a, a lot of Europeans compared with most other parts of India. In fact, it just so happens that nearly all of these earthquakes hit areas where there were lots of Europeans, which might be because um, the British in India liked hills uh, and the Himalaya Hindu Kush region is where a lot of the earthquakes happen for plate tectonics reasons. Um, but the kind of social consequences, more than political, of the, the Assam earthquake were quite interesting because it forced a lot of European survivors to into what would normally be considered pretty socially compromising positions, such as moving into their servants' houses, sleeping in barns, um, generally appearing destitute, which we might read as quite a challenge to the, uh, the kind of narratives of, of colonial discourse, which generally held Europeans as a class above Indians. Now, this is complicated because there were what were called poor whites who worked on the railways, and there were lots of examples that Indians could look at of, um, of Europeans who didn't have a lot of wealth and power behind them. Uh, but this is an unusual social situation in that the earthquake forced people who were typically the European elite, so elites among Europeans, not just elites compared with most Indians, um, into the position of being, um, of being kind of thrown in with everyone else. But still, you see those power dynamics play out because they had servants' lodgings to occupy, for instance, and maybe the servants were exiled to the barns to, uh, to sleep with animals. Um, so I don't know if you'd call that politics exactly, but certainly the, the power dynamics of social uh, of colonial society played out strongly after that earthquake. No demographic change as far as I could make out, by the way. You mentioned demographics as well. Thank you, Dan. I, I can see another question which, which I can read out for you. Do, you. do you think that changes in scientific understanding of earthquakes has played a role in changing government uh, response and expectations of those responses? Uh, the follow-on questions, we'll let you answer that one first. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. <laughs> and I think, yeah, yes to a point. Uh, so, disaster response in general, including earthquake response, has become much more an object of governance over particularly the, the second half of the 20th century. Um, and this is not necessarily just about the, the physical science basis, but also the logistics. So India, Pakistan, many other countries have national and provincial disaster management authorities, um, which have special responsibility for this. The question of how well resourced they are is, is a separate one, which we don't need to get into. Um, but I would also argue that actually, although we didn't have a kind of working theory of plate tectonics until uh, after Indian independence, uh, and the real causes and mechanisms of earthquakes were not very well understood in the colonial period. The basic idea that earthquakes were a natural phenomenon which come up out of the ground uh, and do a lot of damage and kill a lot of people has remained pretty constant. And I think what I've shown is that a lot of what we now think of as state disaster response has also remained pretty constant. Um, there are obvious differences like uh, the major role that international relief organizations now often play, uh, which was which was much more limited uh, after these colonial earthquakes. Um, but if you read the those GSI reports I was talking about beforehand, they were doing um, what we regard now as citizen science surveys, where uh, the GSI geologists wanted to 
get a sense of the exact uh, location and timing of the earthquake. Um, looking at the primary and secondary waves, trying to understand their rate of propagation, trying to um, link that to the different types of rock that were prevalent in different parts of Indian topography. Uh, and there are fantastically detailed chapters in these reports that talk about individual eyewitness accounts um, and an assessment by the scientists of how reliable they thought these reports were, which have their own set of whole own set of um, class and racial and, and other kinds of prejudice embedded into them, which is a separate conversation. Um, but it's fascinating. But they were doing really, really detailed, uh, exacting scientific work. Uh, so in a nutshell, I think earthquake science was already well on the way to being pretty advanced by the time these earthquakes happened. A bigger contrast would be something like the Lisbon earthquake in the mid 18th century when the uh, physical science basis was really not at all well understood. Um, but uh, again, I'm probably talking too long, so I'll uh, give the floor back to the questionnaires. Thank you, Dan. It just happens you actually answered the second question within that one, so thank you. And it was about the appropriateness of the term natural disaster, so thank you. Um, perhaps um, we, we ought to close there this afternoon. And I do thank you, Dan, and everybody in the audience for their questions and, and discussion, uh, at which point I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Jim Jeffers, uh, to close this afternoon's session. Jim. Thanks, and thanks, everyone. Actually, just before closing, if she's still with us, I'm going to ask um, my colleague Giovanna to mention our um, our next event in the series. If you're still with us, Giovanna. I am. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Dan, for the presentation. Uh, uh, wonderful. I'm also very glad to introduce this, the, the next speaker, which will be speaking on the 8th of December at 2 uh, PM and he is Marcus Nuss, who is a, a professor of geography at the South Asia Institute of the University of Heidelberg in Germany. And he will be talking about Himalayan cryosphere changes and local adaptation strategies towards a social hydrological framework for the upper Indus Basin. So we uh, uh, go to the Indus Basin, and as always, you can register, uh, you can uh, book the uh, your your place through our website uh, by just by clicking on the title of the of the contribution. Thank you. Back to Jim. Thanks, Giovanna. Um, all that remains for me to do is to to thank Dan once again for uh, for a fascinating talk. To um, thank all of you for joining us, and thank you for for all of your questions. And um, that's where we close things. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks very much, Jim, and thanks everybody. <laughs>